like to read to you this morning a historical psalm that gives us another sidelight on the heart of the story of Joseph. Psalm 105. And we break into it in verse 14. When God summoned a famine on the land and broke all supply of bread, he had sent a man ahead of them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. His feet were hurt with fetters. His neck was put in a collar of iron until what he had said came to pass. The word of the Lord tested him. The king sent and released him. The ruler of the people set him free. He made him lord of his house and ruler of all his possessions to bind his princes at his pleasure and to teach his elders wisdom. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Father, we come to your revelation this morning and ask that through the written word, you, the living word, may speak to our minds and hearts and to our wills and our strength through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In our survey yesterday, we saw that the book of Genesis divides itself up in six major sections. And we now come to focus on the last of those sections. The last section is very different from several points of view from the sections that precede it. And I would like to just point up some of those differences because they will become important for us. In the fourth section, God made a covenant with Abram that was transmitted to one of Abram's sons, Isaac, and not the other, Ishmael. The same pattern of transmission is repeated in the fifth section, where Isaac transmits this covenant to Jacob and not to Esau. But what has been promised to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob is not simply the transmission from one child in each generation to one child in the next generation. It is something very much bigger. It is that they should be progenitors of a nation. And simple logic tells you that you cannot get from a single patriarchal founder of something new to a nation that holds to its vision if only one son in each generation is designated. So something new has got to happen, and it begins to happen in the sixth section, because this time it's not one son, it's all twelve. And we begin to see the seeds of a much bigger idea. And God's purpose is to transform those twelve to form them into the base of an integrated nation. And we see at once that the brothers' hatred of Joseph and Joseph's dreams of supremacy imperil this project and threaten to stop it at its very inception. Yet through Joseph, God achieves a seemingly impossible objective through a process that is now something essentially new in Genesis. And that is Joseph's suffering. The issue of suffering has not figured largely 
in Genesis, except possibly in the intense psychological suffering of Isaac as Abram came to offer him. But now, long chapters are devoted to this new ingredient which will put Joseph under intense pressure and test him and qualify him to take over power. And his story will be in two parts, the suffering and the reigning. But the aspect of the reigning that is focused on is extraordinary in the whole of literature. It is the use of immense power to achieve a reconciliation. And in the story, you see a balance between almost unlimited political power and administrative power and a human sensitivity that causes the power holder to weep, weep at frequent intervals. It is unparalleled in all of literature. And through it, there is achieved the beginning of an idea that there will then leap up onto a new dimension when we get into the New Testament. Because, of course, those twelve sons were the physical children of Jacob, just as the sons before were physical children. Is that all there is with this? Oh, it will involve family life, but there's something infinitely bigger. As John 1 points out to us, that there's going to be a new phenomenon in the universe. And that is not physical birth, but birth of God's Spirit. And John makes the point, doesn't he? To all who received the Messiah, the Lord Jesus... To get them gave he the right to become what they were not before, and that is children of God who were born. And now comes the point. Not of blood. But that's exactly what Isaac and Jacob and Joseph were. They were born of blood. Not of the will of man, but that's exactly what they were. Jacob was desperate to sleep with Rachel, for example the will of man to produce children. But it's not going to be like that. It's a new dimension. They're going to be born of God. And that is going to be the basic pulsating life that spreads this concept from the one seed to the one family to the vast throng of believers throughout all the centuries. What a magnificent scheme it is, and we're part of it. It's important to catch the difference, isn't it? I remember sitting with some Israeli friends, and uh, a man and a woman uh, with whom I had conversation about the Holocaust and so on, and I showed so much interest in this whole business that the woman quite... Uh, inadvertently said to me, you know, why aren't you a Jew? <laughs> and her husband was absolutely outraged. He said, my dear, you shouldn't say things like that. Well, I said, it's all right. And I lowered my voice to a conspiratorial whisper. <laughs> and I said, uh, but you do realize what I am, don't you? And she said, what are you? I said, I'm a son of Abraham. But she said, you said you weren't a Jew. I said, that's right, but I'm a son of Abraham. <laughs> but she said, that's not possible. I said, well, tell me, what does it take to belong to the chosen people? Well, she said, you've got of a Jewish mother. Oh, I say, really, that's interesting. You mean, uh, as you look back in Scripture, you had Abraham, and, and he produced Isaac. And then he produced Ishmael, and Ishmael's not one of the chosen people because his mother was Hagar. That's right, she says, you've got it. Oh, I said, that's interesting. Because come down to the next generation, Esau, is he part of the chosen people? 
Oh, no, she said. His mother? Oh, she said, there's a difficulty there, isn't there? <laughs> so being a kind Irishman, I decided to help her out. Uh, and uh, I said, you know, it almost looks as if it's not quite physical here. It's, it's as God chose the... Oh, she said, that's right, God chose. I said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> And I said, God has chosen that everyone like me who believes in Hamashiach, Jesus Christ, can become a child of God. Yeah. Wonderful, isn't it? Yeah. We who were afar off, alien from the promises of God in Christ, we've been made near. And that's exactly what is being said in these early chapters of Scripture. And a second related feature that's new in this sixth section is its scale. Abraham and Isaac and Jacob believed God's Word. And against all the evidence, they trusted God to make of them a new nation. And yet, up until this point in Genesis, we're talking about very small things, aren't we? A nomadic family that's not very large wandering around in a tiny country in the Middle East. Well, now, if you look at that a little bit skeptically, as I hope you do, learn a lot looking at Scripture through skeptical eyes, you know. I spent my life doing it. How is it credible that this is a story that's got anything to do with the creator of the universe? The one that invented the stars we saw just there. The one who thought out the electron and the atom. You've got a little group of people wandering around in the desert. But now in this section, the scale expands with a rapidity almost exceeding the acceleration in the Big Bang. Because Joseph steps from an obscure prison in Egypt onto the world stage. And we begin to say, oh, only in seed form, but who could miss the illusion of the dimensions? How this God's chosen one is going to save the world by administrating its food supply and is going to become the bread of life for the nations in a literal way. The scale is new, and it makes our hearts excited as we get to grips with the dimensions of it, because it begins to make sense that we can talk about it at that level. And of course, the key point is that Joseph becomes a witness to Pharaoh. And that's another ingredient. The whole question of witness to the world and the preparation for it, which all of us, of course, need. But it's even bigger still, isn't it? Because Joseph now begins to take on bigger aspects and shadows begin to form and point towards the future and rays of light indicate that there's something bigger. Let's listen to Stephen, the first Christian martyr defending his faith before a murderously hostile crowd in Jerusalem. He tells how the patriarchs rejected Joseph. He tells how they rejected Moses and he builds up to the climax of his speech and he says, you've resisted consistently through history the very men that God chose to be your saviors. And now it's Jesus. His logic was deadly, and they killed him for it. And Joseph forms one of a long line of people who had the guts to stand for God against the flow and witness to God 
and so we shall not be surprised if we find in this man's life patterns of behavior that will recur at a higher level in the life of our Lord, who likewise came to his own, and his own did not receive him, even though he was the Savior of the world and its future king. So we will be multidimensional in our approach, looking, of course, primarily at the life of Joseph in its own right, but being sensitive with an antenna tuned to the principle of multi-significance in Scripture. And in this psalm, we read how Joseph was sold as a slave, and the word of the Lord tested him. We saw section one, the word of God behind the created universe and human beings made in the image of God. We saw the word of God in section two, defining morality. We saw the word of God in section three, unbinding the separation between earth and sea and deluging the world in judgment. The Word of God is a central theme in Genesis. And Abram, Isaac, and Jacob had had on numerous occasions in their lives direct speech of God to stabilize them in their lives. And now we come to a very big difference because God's communication to Joseph is very different. And what is striking, there is no record of him hearing the voice of God directly. Indeed, in the first chapter of his story, the word God doesn't even appear. Yet God did speak to him as a teenager in the form of two dreams that his father, mother, and brothers would bow down to him. Although even at that stage, the evidence that it was from God is not explicit. And as such, it contrasts with the earlier dreams in Genesis where God is always explicitly stated as the originator. Joseph lived a life trusting a God who was mostly silent. Do you? It's a big thing, isn't it? He experienced nothing of the drama that Abram had had when the, he had the vision of the smoking furnace and receiving the covenant directly from God. He had nothing of the experience of his father Jacob when he saw the angelic ladder and God standing at the bottom of it and talking to him. Of course, he would have known of those experiences from his father and his grandfather because he overlapped probably with Isaac's last days. But he himself had largely to trust God without them. And you know, at a conference like this, it happens, doesn't it, that we are very likely to meet people whose experience of God is very much more dramatic than our own. Has that happened to you? It can be discouraging, huh? When you meet people who have such a clear and dramatic sense of God's guidance leading them through life and you feel, well, I'm stumbling along here and you know I sense the Lord but sometimes I'm not so certain and... Yeah. And the man who trusted God in the silence was the man chosen to represent God at the highest level. Be encouraged, please. There's a connection between the two. It's easy to trust drama and spectacular experiences. And they're not unimportant because Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had them, but there's something more, isn't there? And we can derive a deep encouragement from this story because the fact that Joseph was able to achieve so much in later life because he had a faith that trusted God in the absence of the dramatic. He held on to what he understood of God's Word, that one day God would vindicate him, whatever that meant. 
And because he held on to it, at a crucial moment in earth's history, he had the courage to stand as a young man in front of the most powerful emperor in the then known world and tell him straight that there was a God Perhaps it's one of the main reasons, isn't it, that we have our conference. To prepare us not to move in endless Christian circles. I hope you don't move in circles, actually. <laughs> but to get out into the world and witness. And the preparation was tough. It was very lengthy. If you're going to send a space shuttle out, the materials used have got to be laboratory tested to far beyond what they'll experience in the vacuum and the cold intensity of space. And if you're going to be used by God as Joseph was, the pressure that will be put on you before you are used will be inordinate and seemingly disproportional until with hindsight, you can see its point. And so we begin to look at this story. It's a pattern of first suffering and then entering into glory, which the Apostle Peter not only records as what happened to the Lord Jesus, but what would happen to his readers and God himself, after you have suffered a little while, shall himself exalt you. There is suffering before glory. Joseph had a bad start in the sense that he grew up in a dysfunctional family with a father who found it extremely difficult to come to terms with love because his own father hadn't loved him. And he had lost the first love of his life, Rachel. Joseph was the older of her two sons. She died in giving birth to Benjamin. And Jacob was left with a complex family in those days before in vitro fertilization. They use surrogate mothers. They do still. This story is as up-to-date as it could possibly be in terms of medical biology and genetics. And there were four sets of children, three mothers, and I can scarce imagine what the psychological atmosphere was like in that home. But the text now draws our attention to three primary issues that set the scene for our study. And they are these. The project of creating a family integrated and sharing the commitment to the vision that God had was imperiled by three things. Firstly, Joseph brought a bad report about the sons of the two surrogate mothers. Secondly, Jacob openly treated Joseph as his favorite. And thirdly, Joseph had dreams of supremacy and related them to his family. Let's look at them. The bad report. How shall we understand it? Was Joseph simply an innocent 17-year-old telltale and sneak, as we would call him in England? Telling tales and being spiteful. Well, many people think that. On the other hand, there are those that point out that the story of Joseph as a whole gives no evidence of such a flaw later, although it reveals certain character flaws in his brothers that indicate that his reports could have been accurate. 
What is the answer? I don't know. But what is very clear is this, that telling tales, if that's what it was, is a thing that threatens unity and integration. And the Bible warns us against it. You shall not go up and down as a slanderer among your people, says Leviticus 19, and you shall not stand forth against the life of your neighbor. And its context is interesting. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The first instance of loving your neighbor as yourself is devastatingly practical. It is don't tell tales. It's interesting when you analyze it, isn't it? We're at a conference. Have you said anything about anybody else in any of your conversations so far this week? Well, I have. I confess it to you straight away. And tell me, were they always present when you said it about them? Was everything you said about them 100% accurate? Or 80%? Or 50%? Well, I'll not go down and depress you. <laughs> but I think you get my point, don't you? What does that do sometimes? Oh, we have to talk about other people, otherwise life would be very boring, wouldn't it? <laughs> mm. But oh, what it can do among powerful people committed to God's work, ladies and gentlemen. It can ripple through and destroy the very thing that Christianity was designed to produce. It is not an innocent thing. What would happen if somebody were to analyze the principles on which I have judged other people during this week and then apply them to me. We better think that through, you know, because it's going to happen one day. Because at the judgment seat of Christ, as I understand it, which is not the final judgment, of course, we shall have to give account of ourselves. Tell me, on what basis would you give an account of yourself to God? You'd have to use some principles, wouldn't you? You can't just give an account, a reckoning, in a vacuum. Now, suppose God listens to you and then uses those principles to illuminate me. And he's going to do it, isn't he? Do you remember what the Lord Jesus said about it? With what measure you measure the same shall be measured unto you. It's worth thinking about, isn't it? It is one of the principles that's important in Genesis. So I'm not going to judge Joseph. I'd be better looking at him within my own heart. But then, you see, the thing is more complex than that, isn't it? Joseph, it doesn't say he told tales. He brought a bad report. But now the thing becomes more complex because of this. The patriarchs, we are told, rejected Joseph, and it parallels the rejection of Jesus. Why did they reject Jesus? Well, in part because he testified of them that their deeds were evil. You see, there are two sides to this business of evaluation. The fact that we are not to tell tales does not absolve us from moral analysis. And that's the difficulty, isn't it? How do you testify of the world that its deeds are evil? I find it difficult, don't you? How gently the Lord Jesus raised the sin question. You remember when his brothers said, you want publicity? Go up to Jerusalem. Uh, I mean, you're crazy. Why stay up here? Go to the capital. And he said, but you don't understand. Your time's always ready. My hour is not yet come. You see, the problem with me is this. 
I testify of the world that its deeds are evil. That's part of the message. Is it part of yours? In a world that's morally collapsing, we need to think out the way in which we communicate the bad report without coming across as moralistic and judgmental. And that's not always easy, is it? It demands immense sensitivity. We're not given the option of A, either superior moralizing, failing to recognize that we are ourselves sinners, or B, to avoid talking about it altogether. Perhaps the story I heard as a child is helpful, of two Irish Christians called to help someone whose life was in a mess, and on the way the older of the two men said to the younger, do you think you could have done what Jimmy did? And then the younger man said, oh no, I could never imagine I'd do that. Well, he said, just you go back home then, and I'll make the visit on my own. And that's it, isn't it? So whatever motive we ascribe to Joseph's behavior, it may be very complex, because the brothers were a rotten and actually a violent lot. But whatever the motive, it was an ingredient in their hatred, and Joseph had to cope with it. But then the second one is favoritism. Jacob loved Joseph. It's a good thing for a dad to do, of course. But the problem was he was partial. And he didn't keep his preference under control, but expressed it by giving Joseph a magnificent garment. It poured petrol on the fuel of their hatred. And Jacob should have known better. He had himself been born into a family where it was split over who loved who and why. Isaac loved Esau all his life. And Rebecca loved Jacob, and it led to endless problems for Jacob. He ought to have known, but it's so true to life that he didn't learn from his own family experience. And Joseph and Benjamin were so closely connected to the love of his life that he almost couldn't help this favoritism. But it devastated his family as it had done for him. And you know, some of us may have Jacob's problem. When children are small, they don't occupy much of space-time. But as they grow, we discover powerful young adults elbowing our space-time, don't we? And we discover that children are different. And some of them are very agreeable, just like us. <laughs> and some of them for some curious genetic reason, usually connected with their mother or their father, but certainly not <laughs> us. They, well, we, you know, we just don't cog. And then comes the problem. You parents, and I'm one grandparent, how hard it is to be fair. I look back over life, you know, and I think I've tried, but I've failed. I'm sure I failed. What have I built into my kids in terms of attitude? When you've only one child, the problem doesn't arise at that level, but it arises with more than one. And we're faced with this enormous problem of subduing our preferences so that our kids will feel equally loved. And then what happens when one follows the Lord and the other doesn't? And we break our hearts as parents. Do we keep the door open? Or do we slam it in their face? Many a weeping parent has told me that it's been years before there's been any progress. This is tough, isn't it? This is real life. You see, it is so important that we operate at two levels. 
the physical level of human transmission of life and the spiritual level of the spiritual transmission of life. And we've got to work on both, which is why Scripture talks about both. And it's very complex. And I've shed tears, I'll be honest with you. And I'm sure you have too. For our parents failed us. Some of you may have felt the glow of a father's smile or a mother's. In a large audience like this, some of you, your memories of a father are dark, and you've been abused, as many children in our world today. And now you try to cope with your children, those dark memories that haunt you of what fatherhood is, and you struggle to be one. Oh, we have got to have hearts big enough to understand that we don't all start in the same position. We all haven't all had stable Christian homes with love without abuse. Maybe the majority have not experienced that. We may have been the favorite, or we may have suffered like Joseph's brothers and know how hard it is not to be the favorite. And we struggled all our lives to get somebody to love us and recognize that there's some dimension about us that's worth appreciating. And here we sit with our infinitely complex psychologies. And we sit in front of the Word of God. I'm glad we do, because I don't understand even my own heart and why I do half the things I do, and you don't either. But God does. This is part of our education in the ways of God and in the government of God. You see, the awesome thing about Genesis is very simple. God says, you run the universe for me. And by the way, I'm going to make it work this way. I'm going to give you the capacity to transmit life. And so you go to the hospital or at home, and you hold in your hands a tiny being that's squalling and struggling and making all kinds of mess. And it suddenly dawns on you that this child's got to live forever, you know. And God has given me the responsibility of bringing it up. How's that? Real delegated responsibility. Many governments don't believe in it. Some Christians don't either, but God does. It's an awesome responsibility. And yet, we can't avoid it, can we? God has set drives in us that are so deep. How fragile are we humans? Our parents may be long gone, but our family is riven by the tensions over parents that tried to be fair, and they split up the family estate, and they didn't get it right. And it's cutting the heart out of a brother or sister or relative. And leaves resentments all of life from both sides. How do you get it right, folks? It happened in Genesis. Constantly arguing over birthrights and who got what. And as adults, even in Christian circles, as C.S. Lewis pointed out, and we see there's an inner ring and we're not in it, and we feel left out. Why is there so much emphasis in section after section of Genesis on favoritism? Because it's lethal. 
and it can get more complicated, can't it? Jacob discovered he was specially chosen. And he began to think and thought for years that because God had given him a special role in God's historical purposes, it didn't really matter how he achieved them. Here's a much more subtle thing. The very achieving of God's explicit stated purposes can be done by cutting moral corners. Jacob thought he could do what he liked because he was special. You'd never say that, would you, as an evangelical Christian? But it's very easy to think and behave like it, isn't it? Dieu pardonne, c'est son métier. God forgives. That's his business. And he won't mind if I cut the corners. Really? Special. You specially gifted? Oh, that's risky, isn't it? It's so easy to confuse giftedness with character and cause division because of that. Through our competitiveness. And partiality and favoritism was such a threat to the early church that Paul devotes chapter after chapter to it. And it's interesting, isn't it? That at the beginning of 1 Corinthians, we discover one of the most dangerous forms of it. The church was beginning to form parties. Partiality. Parties. Around strong leaders. And people were beginning to say, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos. And even, well, I'm not of any of those, I'm of Christ. Let me illustrate this and bring it down to earth by the kind of conversation that sometimes I have. And I just choose what happened recently. Somebody comes up to you at a conference and says, look, um, I've been listening to you. Can you tell me, are you an Arminian or a Calvinist? That's an interesting thing I say, you know. You put me in a great difficulty. Well, I didn't mean to put you in a difficulty. Um, uh, but why are you in a difficulty? Oh, I say, well, let me ask you a question. Tell me, are you a Paulinian or an Apollosist? I say, what on earth do you mean? I said, are you a Paulinian or an Apollosist? Well, what's that got to do with it? Well, I said, you know, if we had the choice... Paul, Apollos, Arminius, and Calvin. Suppose we had to choose. Do you know, if I were pushed, I'd prefer myself to take the name of Paul. Because I actually owe more to him than the other three. Although I'm so grateful to the men of God of history. Every time I go past the cross in the road of Broad Street in Oxford, I get off my bicycle. I think of Cranmer, Ridley, and Latimer. Play the man, Mr. Ridley, as he started to be consumed in the flames, for today we light a flame in England that shall never be put out. I'm grateful to such men. But the problem is that Paul will not allow me to take his name. Outraged, he says. Was Paul crucified for you? Well, if he wasn't, you better not take his name. How grateful I am to Latimer, Ridley, Cranmer, and all the rest of them. But you know, Ridley, he died a martyr, but he wasn't crucified for me. He says, Paul, you better not take his name or you'll confuse the gospel. And you'll start to make up parties. It's worse still, isn't it, actually? Because one of the odd things about this kind of behavior is this. The objection comes, but aren't we allowed to discuss doctrine and what we believe about it? And of course we are. But you see, if I answer the question, are you a Paulist or an Apollosist or an Arminian or a Calvinist, with a label, we're adult enough to know that those labels have a whole spectrum of meanings. And what can happen subtly is this, that the answer affects the dimension of fellowship. 
And the tragedy is, it has happened without discussing a single verse of Scripture. Have you ever noticed that? People are none the wiser. They pigeonholed you, and they may well have done it wrongly, because their conception of what an apologist is, is not yours. If you think this is an easy problem, try stopping doing it. And there's a deeper principle at stake, isn't there? As Paul points out in 1 Corinthians 4, 6, I have transferred these things, applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers, so that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written. And that's the problem, isn't it? It is so easy to use the names of people, the names of ordinances, the names of principles of church government to be partial isn't it? And you notice what Paul does. He brings the cross into it. That's how seriously he views it. And bringing the cross into partiality is what Peter does too. He tells us that God is an impartial judge as Father. He judges each person's work impartially. And so we'd better be careful how we behave in holiness and fear, seeing we were redeemed not with corruptible things, but with the precious blood of Christ. And finally, we are to be impartial because of who's watching. As Paul says to Timothy, who was nervous and had to take, thankfully, a little bit of wine for his stomach's sake, he got easily threatened. And Paul says, remember, Timothy, when you've got hard decisions to make and judgments to make, remember who's watching. I charge you in the sight of Christ Jesus and of the elect angels, the whole universe is watching what you do. If ever there was a thing meant to stabilize, it's that. And then there were Joseph's dreams. And that made the tension so much worse. Where did the dreams come from? God Oh, you're going to blame God then for the problems? Well, yes and no. I suppose you might argue that Joseph could have kept it to himself. The very interesting thing about this is how few dreams God sent. Have you thought about that? Jacob never dreamed that Joseph was still alive. Joseph never dreamed that Jacob was still alive. These two dreams and then silence. God spoke through dreams. Now, of course, we need to be careful that we don't mix things up. Paul warned in Colossians of people that think everything they get worked up in their own imagination. Any dream they have is spiritually significant. And he said, watch it. Let no one disqualify you by going on in detail about visions puffed up without reason by a sensuous mind and not holding fast to the head. The problem is some Christians have some things going on in their heads, but they're not holding fast to the head. There is a vast distinction between the inner, expected, driven generation of imagination and things that God unmistakably gives. And we need to be careful, which is why, of course, the New Testament does not encourage us particularly to use this as a surrogate for the Word of God in terms of our guidance. And so God sent these dreams of ultimate supremacy, and they led to attempted murder. And we know the story of how the brothers saw Joseph coming, and we see a moral degeneration. First of all, murder. How are you going to unite a family if one half wants to murder the other, for a start? And then Reuben makes a mess of it because he gets Joseph thrown into a 
pit to buy some time, but then he's not around when the caravan happens to come. And Judah becomes a slave trader and sells his brother for 20 pieces of silver. How are you going to do anything with a slave trader? It's going to take amazing grace, isn't it? As it did centuries later for John Newton, who inspired William Wilberforce. Oh, what a story is the story of God's grace. Because this is not simply the story of Joseph. It's the story of the man who entered the slave trade to get rid of him. And God is going to put the two alongside. He's not only going to do that. He's going to do something so spectacular that at this nadir of history we could never have even begun to think about it. He's going to make Joseph and not, De, Judah, not Joseph, the direct ancestor of the ruler of the world. Big story, isn't it? And finally, they get rid of Joseph and they devise a scheme to deceive Jacob and they take a coat, his coat, they dip it in blood of a goat and they come to Jacob and they say, recognize whose coat is this? And there was no DNA testing. And he's deceived by the blood of a goat on a coat. Oh, oh, what memories that any of us who've any intelligence of the very same man, Jacob, now trying to read the evidence when he himself, years before, had dressed himself up in a goat skin and used his clothes to deceive his own father. Oh, God didn't approve of the methods Jacob used to achieve his aims. The mills of God grind slowly, but they grind exceeding well. And with what measure you measure, it shall be measured to you. See the sophistication of the sovereignty of God and human responsibility in this. That now the man is facing a dose of his own medicine that's going to keep him locked into sorrow for 20 years because he misread the physical evidence and he got it wrong. The matter of evidence is going to be a very important thing in our story. But unfortunately this clock is working on Central European time. <laughs> and so we'll stop. Thank you very much.